good evening students let's discuss the answers for the recently conducted uh, main examination so i am going to discuss the questions uh, related to economics so i am going to discuss the following questions now uh, let's uh, let me start the uh, discussion for the question number 1 now the question number 1 is so as written on the board this is the question faster economic growth requires increased share of manufacturing sector in gdp particularly of msme comment on the progress sorry comment on the present policies of the government in this regard okay this is the question so how we have to approach the question the question is very simple faster economic growth requires increased share of manufacturing sector so i just give a small introduction about the contribution of the manufacturing with respect to the faster economic growth so here we all know that in our country uh, we are getting uh, nearer to 30 percentage of the growth from the uh, secondary sector from secondary we all know that secondary sector national income uh, is broadly classified into uh, the secondary sector income comes from manufacturing it comes from second uh, it comes from construction comes from mining and quarrying fourth one electricity gas water supply other utilities so all four combined is called as a secondary but the question is about the manufacturing so in the india's secondary sector national income manufacturing contribution is 15 percentage so that is the contribution you can give a small sort of introduction like this india's manufacturing sector's contribution to the overall gdp of secondary sector is 15 percentage okay so it is a 15 15 so overall is around uh, 30 so secondary sector is around uh, around um, manufacturing is around 15 then this provides almost a uh, job to 12 percentage of the overall employment structure of our country like this you give a sort of introduction then the now the look at the the next next part of the question share of economic growth sorry faster economic growth requires increased share of manufacturing sector in gdp particularly of msme so in manufacturing what is the role of msme so according to the economic survey data we find that in manufacturing if the manufacturing is contributing 15 percentage in the secondary sector then what is the so the overall is around 30 percentage manufacturing is contributing 15 percentage within the manufacturing the two contributors are there one is large companies also contributing to the growth of manufacturing and small companies are also contributing so the msmes they are contributing nearer to 40 percentage of the overall manufacturing the overall manufacturing is around 100 out of the 100 40 percentage is coming from the msme which means the uh, so called large companies they are contributing 60 percentage msmes they are contributing almost equally in equal to the large companies in this angle you give just uh, you based on the words which are given in the question you frame a introduction based on your choice so you have to approach the first part in this way economically try to validate or try to uh, add some uh, economic figures to validate the statement or to give some value addition to the to your answers then you step into the, the this part of the question the question is about the comment on the present policies of the government in this regard so we not write about the old measures and all what are the current measures we have in india for supporting the msme in those uh, with respect to those measures we have to give our comment the question is about comment so we should not write uh, only about the measures we should comment on the measures so how what are the measures first you can list out let's understand you can write or, or while writing the measure itself you can give a comment this measure will lead to this impact in the uh, economy or will provide this benefit to the msme in this angle you have to draft or you have to frame your answer for example we have many measures now if you take the measure number 1 we have the measure number 1 called as the uh, the public procurement policy you all would have heard about public procurement policy so under the public procurement policy what what is the what is the policy approach followed by the government is under the public procurement policy government says that if any one of the government undertaking government departments or any government ministry or if any central public sector enterprises so any government entities when they buy anything from the market 25 percentage of their purchase should come from the msme so you have to buy minimum 25 from msme then rest you can buy from msme also from any any players also so it is a kind of policy approach which gives you now what is the comment so this approach gives a a, 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 a minimum a minimal minimal minimum or minimal assured demand 
to the MSMEs. As we are giving the minimum assured demand to the MSME, they can do some decent business in the economy. So, this will en they ensure the minimum uh, economic growth of the MSME. Like this, you have to comment on the uh, impact of the measure. You give your comment, okay, what, uh, what, what benefits they will uh, derive out of the measure. So, this is about the first one, public procurement policy. Then, recently we all have uh, come across the classification, revision of the MSME. So, what is the revised MSME classification? We know that earlier we had the classification uh, separately for the manufacturing and for the service sector. But now, we are having the same classification both for the manufacturing and service sector. We do not have any separate classification for manufacturing entities and for service entities. And then now we have revised the classification to the upward level. For example, earlier the values were around, uh, were around for example, maximum, the maximum, for example, you take the uh, micro and then small and medium. So, we are starting from the level of 10 lakhs and then 25 lakhs and then 2 crore and then 5 crore. Like this, we had some limit. But now we have revised up to the level of 250 crore turnover. And investment level also, we have increased the investment level to 50 crore. You all would have known about the classification and all. Less than 1 crore for micro, less than 5, uh, less than, uh, five crore uh, turnover for the micro, and then less than 10 crore investment okay, for the small, and then 50 crore turnover for the small, and then okay, 50 crore investment uh, capital can be invested, the company will be called as a medium. Up to 250 crore turnover, they will be regarded as the uh, medium company. So, this upward revision, this policy change of the government, uh, decision of the government to revise the MSME, gives the flexibility to the MSMEs to be in the MSME category, even though when their business progresses, when they improve the capital. So, this will incentivize them. This will motivate them. This will encourage them to do more investments or put more capital. When they put more capital, it will lead to more capital formation, technological advancement, all these things will take on the, will happen in the MSME company and this will ensure the economic growth of the MSME companies. In this angle, you can, you can write any sort of comment. So, but the, but you must write about the comment. And then this is about the second point. Second point is about the revision of the MSME classification. Second point. Then third point, we know that how important a credit is for a business. For any business, there must be adequate credit must be given. So, but when the people, when they go for credit, the bank people considering the nature of the business, they ask for the collateral. And then some companies, they have the collateral ability, they are able to give the collateral and then they are able to receive the loan. But MSMEs do not have the, the collateral adequacy, so they are not able to get the required amount of capital. So, here we have a scheme, we have a policy approach of the government. What is the policy approach of the government? Here the government says that, so under the, we have a scheme, we have an announcement based on the announcement policy of the government, we have a sort of a fund called as a CGTMSC is a sort of fund which is operating in India. So, what is the full form is called as a Credit Guaranteed Trust Fund for Micro and Small Enterprises. Let me repeat, Credit Guaranteed Trust Fund for Micro and Small Enterprises. So, what we are doing under the fund? So, under this, we have constituted a fund in our country and this fund, okay, serves as a, serves as a collateral. So, when any MSME player, when they go and ask for a loan, you do not ask any collateral to them when they, you give them loan. So, when they fail to repay from this backup, from this fund, okay, government will provide the repayment to the bank. So, this will act as a collateral to the bank. So, the bank can do the business in an uninterrupted manner and these people can also, they can avail the loan, okay. So, without any hassles, they can avail the loan. So, we have, government provides them, do not worry, I provide them the collateral. So, this is one of the policy initiative which provides the uninterrupted credit flow to the uh, business. In this angle, you can write this the comment. Then, next one is, we all know that uh, the modernization, mechanization, technology and all, how important those things are for a business. But for example, if I am doing a business, when I, if I plan to upgrade my business, okay, by, by investing on some technology, so the most important requirement is capital. I may have, I may not have. So when I don't have the capital, then I may delay the, the decision to, uh, to upgrade my business or to bring some technology. So here, government okay, comes in. Okay, at this point, the government says that, when a company, when you are planning to increase your, uh, your technological level or when you make some, uh, when you increase your investment for upgrading the technology, say so here, whatever is the amount you are investing on technology, we will give you a subsidy of 15 percentage, which means, okay, here we have a, the, the name of the scheme is called as a, a capital linked, okay, subsidy, okay, which means uh, for the company which are doing the uh, capital investment, when you do 10 lakhs, then 15 percentage on the uh, 10 lakhs. So, credit linked capital subsidy is the exact name of the scheme. So, credit linked capital subsidy. So, we are giving investment for the, uh, so investment support for the capital goods. Credit linked capital subsidy. When you do 1 crore, then 15 lakhs is the subsidy. 85 lakhs is your, your money. 
So the companies, they are going to invest in their business. But here the government is giving a, a much needed support so that they can, they can technologically advance their business. They can improve their productivity, improve their production, improve their income, which will contribute to the growth of the company at the micro level and also the country at the national level. So that is called as a uh, credit linked because based on the credit, we, uh, they differentiate the subsidy amount. Credit linked capital subsidy for the micro and small enterprises. That is an extreme called as a credit linked capital subsidy scheme. Okay. So subsidy scheme for the micro and small enterprise. Then uh, we know about the other initiatives and all. Okay. That is, you know, uh, for example, in the during 1989, we passed an important uh, act called as a, uh, the SIDBI Act of India. And then we established a SIDBI in our economy. So SIDBI was established known as a Small Industries Development Bank of India. So SIDBI was a statutory body, is a, is a statutory body. And then SIDBI promoted one more institution called as Mudra. And all these things are the very clear policy initiatives, intentions of the government, which clearly says that. So I have the kind of institutional arrangement in the country. SIDBI will provide loan to the small industries, all the all small scale are all MSME. And within the MSME, special focus on the micro enterprises is given by the government under the Mudra, Micro Units Development Refinance Agency. So we are trying to provide the seamless financial assistance to the micro finance enterprises, to, sorry, to the uh, micro enterprises through this institutional arrangement. Then we have the other thing. We have a kind of a portal, portal called as a champion portal. What is a champion portal? It is a one-stop solution we are trying to provide to all the MSMEs through the champion portal. So they can register and then they can uh, help the government uh, support in the procurement process and then for any getting any suggestion about the about, about the business, what they are doing. And then for any grievance, okay, they can file the grievance also. Grievance, the uh, redressal will be done through the portal. So like this, it shows a clear policy initiative of the government where they are trying to support the small players in the economy. This is about a champion sport. And then, okay, uh, there is one more thing called as a, uh, uh, called as a uh, foreign, uh, the, the tender, foreign tender or the, for example, the disallowance for the business up to 200 crores, which means uh, when we are giving any business tender to the foreign players, up to 200 crores, the business tenders should not be given up to 200 crore, which means when the 200, within the 200 crore, the business projects will be given only to the, to our, our players. So in this angle, we have just, uh, we have made the, dis, uh, okay, the, the disallowed, the disallowance of the tenders up to 200 crores. This disallowance will divert the projects towards the, our own players. So they can make use of it. And then there's a clear cut policy approach where government says, when the volume of the business goes above 200 crore, give the business tender to the foreign people. So for the other way, for this business, you just must look at that they have make those business flow within our country. These are the clear intentions of the government of India, which shows that they are they are always okay. They want to support the micro, small, medium enterprises, and then which are because they are playing the very important role. They are playing the very important, crucial role in in the development of our economy. So for the faster and for economic growth, the manufacturing is very vital. Especially the MSME plays very important role and government has taken enormous measures and government will continue also to do in the future also. In this angle, you can give a small conclusion. And then I, I have just uh, mentioned some uh, uh, of the measures. So apart from this, there are plenty of policy measures also. You can write about, you can mention about those measures also. So these are the points you can write for this question, 10 mark question. Okay. So it's uh, writing some five or six or points is more than enough. But how you are writing the point, giving the comment and the, what the measure will uh, how it will impact the people in that way you have to draft your answer. Okay, now let's step into the uh, next question, question number two. So question number two, next question is, question number two, what is the status of digitalization in the Indian economy? Status of digitalization in the Indian economy, examine the problems, examine the problems faced. Okay, so examine the problems faced in this regard and suggest improvements is the uh, question. So now, here you write to mention, give a small introduction on the digitalization. What are the, how you have to give the introduction? So we know about digitalization is a process of, uh, process of implementing the digital technologies in the economic and then social spheres of the, of the country. So how we are doing the, running the economy, how we are okay, so in the social angle, so how we are transferring the, uh, delivering the social benefits to the economy, and then how we are governing the country in all the process, or else in another angle, in the business angle, uh, which means in the corporate angle, in the individual angle, and the government angle, how we are bringing digital technology, this process, entire mechanism is called as a digitalization. Then, okay, you can give a small introduction because examine the problem is the second part. We have the kind of the uh, report, okay, for example, at the global level. Global level, we have a report called as a 
digital adoption index which means that tells about the status of digitalization so that way that, ind that index is called as a digital adoption report we have at the global level released by the world bank so under the digital adoption report they measure the status of digitalization among the companies among the corporates how they have implemented the digital technology then within the people okay how the people are using the technology whether the, they have the access and the utility or usage of the services and then and then okay they are considering the uh, the the process or the status of digitalization among the government in the e governance process all those areas how the government is uh, reaching the people so in this angle you can give any sort of introduction is a process of bringing the digital technologies in the economic and social aspects of the economy i like that you can go give, give and then following that okay we have the kind of the measure at the global level digital adoption uh, index digital adoption index okay not i digital adoption index uh, in index released by world bank where the uh, they measure based on three dimension at the corporate level status digitalization at the corporate level digitalization at the people level and digitalization at the government level so like this you give a small sort of introduction so it's about status of digital digitalization then and then you can give one more uh, you can write in this way also so the main uh, the impact the digitalization what what it can do to the economy of the country is it reduces the distance digitalization reduces the distance between the government and the people or reduces the distance between a corporate and then between people and between people and people reduces the barrier whoever may be wherever you are you can reach other person through the digital technology in this angle you can write about the anything about the digital digitalization you give a, a small introduction then the question is about the status we know about the uh, the report says that indonesia india and all they are the top performing countries almost 90 percentage okay the status we have digitalized like this the report says and then you can write our own india report okay the, about the penetration so more than 79 percent of the penetration of the okay so the internet we have in our country like this you would add some facts regarding the status of digitalization so give a small sort of intro then about your, your status or some, some numbers okay the statistical evidence which you have which you read in the paper you give the numbers sort of that based on this report okay mention or based on the uh, the, uh, the penetration of the internet all those in rural area urban area like this you give a small introduction based on the facts then you step into the second part examine the problems faced by the people in this uh, faced in this regard and suggest improvements what are the problems we face it's a very not only this question is a uh, general one we all can attend so what are the problem number one when we try to implement the first problem is we have the problem called as a digital divide which means uh, the many people they are the people they don't have the proper awareness awareness angle we have the digital divide second angle based on the facility based on the availability of facility so rural the internet penetration is more near to 80 percent in india but when you take the get into the penetration you find that it is more in the urban area than in the rural area so digital divide in the in the with respect to the availability of the facility and with respect to the kind of the knowledge okay with kind of the the knowledge what the people have so this is the first one we have the so examine the problem in this is a problem so what is examine the problem so question is about the critical ex is examine the problem now so writing about the problem you should not stop you should say that okay we have the digital divide so the things are not uniform so the things are not reaching exactly in all the areas because of the presence of the digital divide in our economy like this you make a mention then you write about the second thing second thing is about the, the digital, along with the digital divide you write about the the cyber security so whenever we talk about the digital technology we always talk about the cyber security and then threats associated with the digital the digitalization so when you are trying to convert all the process into the digital manner automatically comes okay comes the threat cyber security so here because of this okay we are not able to do the transaction in a safe manner the people they are not able to have the trust on the on the, on the digital transactions so the confidence is not getting created among the people so always we have a threat because of the digitalization that's the second thing you write the mention then you examine then what other things uh, so the privacy of the people so we know how important the privacy of the people the people's the privacy data okay all all the, all the the personal things so the privacy is getting compromised many information okay related to the, the personal information healthcare information financial information so all those things are easily okay hacked okay things are getting leaked so we have the, the privacy uh, the issues because of the digitalization when you go the distance is getting reduced but this threat also we are facing like this you write the, like this. then apart from this okay what are the other things we have we are regarding we don't have the proper infrastructure so infrastructure means the the institutional infrastructure or technological infrastructure 
So because we don't have the adequate capital information or capital formation is not taking place. So we don't have the adequate infrastructure to implement the uh, digital technology. So then this is about the uh, challenge which we have. Then you can write about the next thing called as a regulatory. Regulatory complexities. So the because most of the rules which we have regarding digitalization, they are outdated and they are overlapping with the other sectors. We don't have the clear cut exactly the current day relevant things we don't have. So in this angle, we have the we have the some sort of issues which must be addressed. Like this, you can examine, you can write, and then you just you go, go beyond the beyond writing the point. Then you mention about the improvements. What are the improvements? For example, cyber security, how to address the uh, address the issue. We must invest more on advanced technologies when you do it. Okay, when we just when when we invest on advanced technologies, we could also give counter to the the, the cyber threats. We can provide the, provide the uh, safety to the people. Those are involved in the transactions. In this angle, you can write the digital divide. How we can address the digital divide? What are the improvements? One is by improving the penetra penetration. So giving it the focus to the all the rural area. For example, a step in this regard. What we are doing? Bharatnet. You can mention. Bharatnet is a program which we are trying to improve the our connectivity all areas. Then you can mention about the uh, about the lack of awareness. Of, uh, awareness was a point of digital divide. So there you can write. We are now the improvement. Now we are we are we are we are moving in the right direction. National digital literacy mission is a step in this direction taken by the government of India, which will address the digital divide. Okay, in the near future. Then about regulatory complexity, how it can be addressed. So by simplifying the procedures, and then okay by introducing the e-governance measures. So these things are now okay automatically okay the regulatory complexity okay can be okay but like lessened in the economy. Then okay you can mention about how the privacy angle. So, Personal Data Protection Act of 2023, we mentioned. The improvement is now recently government of India has passed the act called as a Personal Data Protection Act of 2023. It is a step taken in the by, by, in this direction for ensuring the data privacy to the people and then business business and then business and then okay the government of the country. We are trying to protect the data. So, in this angle, uh, you can mention about these are the improvements. Like this, you can give the suggestions and then more and more investments, more and more uh, uh, more and more investment, the capital formation must take place in advanced technologies like uh, blockchain technology, we have to invest in the 5G technology, we have to invest artificial intelligence, we have to invest and then we have to train our people also, our human resource must be skilled enough to absorb the technology or technology. So, these are the things which could be, uh, which can be done so that India can exactly utilize the opportunity or we can exactly travel in the direction in which we are traveling. So, to do it, uh, continue the process or okay, journey in a sustained manner, these are the measures which must be undertaken by the government of India. Like this, you give an answer. This is about the question number two. So, these are the 10 mark questions. Now, uh, we want to step into the 15 mark question. I think the question number is uh, 11. Take the question number 11. Okay, now this is the question. Uh, we want to discuss, for which we want to discuss the answer. And the question is, most of the employment in India is structural in nature. Examine the methodology adopted to compute unemployment in the country and suggest improvements. Okay, this is the question. So, first, the how to approach the question? First, you give an introduction about the unemployment. Unemployment is structural unemployment. Or you can give introduction about the unemployment also, you can write. Or you can write about the structural unemployment. Then examine the methodology. What are the methods we have to measure the unemployment? And then about the compute unemployment in the country. Suggest improvements in this angle. So, first, you would write about the structural unemployment. Then you write about the methodology, what we are following. Then you have to examine the, the drawbacks, okay, drawbacks and then the plus of the method, plus and minus of the methodology. Then you have to suggest the improvements, what, what, what should be done. So now structural unemployment means what is meant by structural unemployment, the introductory part. So you write about, for example, uh, in simple words, unemployment due to structural changes of an economy, we call it as structural unemployment. Now what is meant by structural changes? For example, a country may move up the ladder. For example, country may uh, may bring some technology because of the entry of the new technology. My country will go will, will, uh, the the production process will go to the next level. So the process will go to the next level, but the people their skills will be at the lower level. So the business will require the kind of skills which may not be available with the people. So structurally, technologically, country has gone to the next level. But here the people they are at this level with this pe people with the, with the don't they who don't. People, those who do, as, they, as they don't have the skills, they cannot be employed in the in the companies. Companies, they are ready to give work, but the people may not be suitable for the, the profile or for the, 
the skill sets which are required by the company. So this uh, concept, so the premise is mismatch of the skill set. So in this angle, you have just defined the sexual unemployment. So it is the it is the scenario or situation of the mismatch in the skill set. So this is about the uh, sexual unemployment. So the people they don't have the skills. So also the, the jobs may not be provided to the people. That is uh, why they don't have the skills. Means because the technology may be advanced, or the people may not be updated, or the educational policy or, or the kind of the uh, skilling mechanism may not be uh, adequate or maybe inadequate in economy. So like this, from this you give a small brief introduction about sexual. Then you get into the uh, second part of the question. Examine the methodology adopted to compute unemployment in the country. Suggest improvement. First of all, when we talk about the unemployment, the thing is, first, how do we or when do we call a person as unemployed? We call a person as unemployed when the person is eligible and willing to work, but the country is not giving the opportunity to work. Then we call the person as unemployed. The person who is eligible, eligible means above the age of 14, he must be willing to work, yes, he must be seeking work, but he is eligible and he is willing to work, but he is not getting the uh, uh, opportunities to work, then we call the person as unemployed. So here the definition is, unemployment definition is, person who is eligible and the person who is willing to work, we, and when he is not getting opportunity, we call the person as unemployed. Then how do we find that that person is unemployed? For example, there are crores and crores of people out there in the country. For example, one person would have, one person is uh, eligible and the person is willing and then the person, okay, person, may, he might have worked for some 30 days. Another person would have worked for 70 days. Another person would have worked for 120 days. Another person would have worked for 220 days in a year. So here among these people, whom do we treat as the employed person? Because this person worked for 30 days, this person worked for 70 days and this person wanted to be, whom do we, we will consider as employed people, because the question is about the methodology. So here for this, we have the kind of methods, okay, when do we call a person as unemployed, based on certain number of days. So when he, when he has not worked for certain number of days, we call them as unemployed. So this for this area, we get the clarity when we understand about the methodology. So what is the methodology? The methodology is, we follow different methods. So one is called as the, first one is called a usual principal status. Under the usual principal status, here we call a person as employed when the person is uh, worked for more than 180 days in a year. So, when the person found to be worked for more than 180 days in a year, we call the person as employed person. Then we have one more similar method called as a usual subsidiary status. Under the subsidiary status, a person worked for 30 days will be taken as an employed method. So, in the employment methodology, when we use the word, this data is taken based on the subsidiary status. Then we must understand that a person worked for 30 days is considered as an employed person. But he, so here the person worked for 31 days is called as an employed person in the country. But in this method 180 days, so a person worked for 31 days, he will be considered as unemployed person in the first method. So these are the understanding what we must have. Then apart from this, we have other methods also. These two things belong to the same category. What category? Here we ask the person last one year. How many days the person worked? So this is about last one year. How many days were work? How many days the people, the person was working? So in this angle, we ask the question. Based on the answer, we can we, we we classify the person as employed or unemployed. But second method is called as a current weekly status. Current weekly. And in current weekly status, what we are doing in this method, the reference period is here one year. Just yes, we we were asking the person how, how many days he, uh, he was working during last one year. But here we will ask the person. Last one week, okay, okay, sorry for interruption, okay, now, in the current weekly status, what we do, so here we take the reference for one week, one week, we take the, we ask the person, last one week, what the person was doing, so here we measure the unemployment or employment based on the reference period one week, when the person found to be working for one hour in the last one week, he is considered to be employed. Less not even one hour, then the person will be considered as an unemployed person. That is second method, current weekly status. The next one is called as the current daily status. Here, this day, in this status, we take the data. Actually, here what we do, here the one week is the reference period here also. But here we take the we, we, we take into assessment every day, each and every day, last seven days, how many hours the person was working on each and every day. So, one day, more than four hours means full day work. And then more than less than one uh, four hour means half day work. In this angle, we take into count based on the number of hours worked on a particular day. 
So these are the three basic approaches which we follow. So based on this only, we find whether a person is employed or unemployed. So these are the three things. Then using these approaches, we have some methods. These are the normal thing. What we have, because we, have, we, we, find, we, we arrive at where a person is employed or unemployed based on this. So we mention about, so we have the three kinds of measurement. So like this, we mention about the current weekly status and then about daily status and then usual principal status. We just mention about all these things. Then these methods are applied by the two different agen agencies in our economy. One is NSO and early it was done by NSSO. Now we know that it is done by NSO and the Labor Bureau. So using this, okay, the methods, they are releasing two different data, unemployment data in economy. What are the data? So that you must mention in the paper. These are the two kinds of methods. How do we arrive at the arrive whether a person is employed or unemployed? But using this usual principal status and subsidiary status, what are the two different data we have in the economy that you must mention in the paper? What are the two different uh, uh, data of unemployment we have? One is called, one is the NSO. NSO is releasing the data called as the Periodic Labor Force Survey. This data is an annual data, annual data releasing. So, you have to mention, okay, NSO releasing the Periodic Labor Force Survey. Data is released in an annual manner and this data is a supply side data. This data is a supply side data. So, why we are getting into all these details and all? Just you have a look at the question. Question is about the examine the methodology. Otherwise, we need not write about these things and all. The question is about the methodology. So, the question about examine the methodology. Not only just, just uh, what are the, no, the question is not about what type of question. It is a way we have to examine. Examine the methodology adopted to complete unemployment in the country and suggest improvements. So, we are going in detail into the methods. Otherwise, these methods and all we should not write in the main answers. So, here we should write about the, about the methods. So, here, so these are the things. And then NSO, they are following, the, using those methods, we are following the two different data. One is the NSO data, periodic labor force survey data. And then this data, supply side data. What is meant by supply side? We take the data from the laborers. We take the data from the workers. Or we take the data from the people. We go to people, we ask the people how many days they work during the last one year or during the last uh, one uh, last one week. Then based on the release the data, take the data. That is called as a PPL of us. In India, since independence, we were having only the supply side data in our economy. We are having only the supply side data. Understand that the, the, uh, we want to learn about the new method. So, this is the method which we are having. But recently in 2020-21, Government of India introduced a new method. So, NSO, they are releasing one data. Now, recently one more data is released by the government. That data is released by the Labor Bureau. Labor Bureau is releasing one more data. For this data, they have given a name called as a Quarterly Employment Survey. So, releasing data. And the speciality of this data is, this data is not a supply side data. For the first time in our country, we are releasing data based on demand side. This data is a demand side data. What is a demand side data? Demand side data means here, we are taking, earlier demand side data was not available here. But now we are taking data in the demand angle also. So what is the meaning of the demand side data here? We, we, because who demand the, demand the work? Employers. So, we take the data from the companies. We go and ask the company. Normally, from them, data are, are collected. We ask them how many employ, employment opportunities, how many jobs you gave during last year, last month. How many jobs are vacant in your companies? Vacancies and then about the postings. So, and then about the, okay, so the, the people, those who resigned the jobs. So, in this angle, we take the data from the companies and then we release that. This number of employment jobs, employments are given by the companies. So, the employment is 7 percentage, employment is 10 percentage this month. In this angle, we get the picture about the demand perspective of the economy. And this demand data is released by the labor bureau in two angles. How, what methodology they are following here? They are releasing data in two and two dimensions. One is, companies where less than 10 people are working, that data is released by informal data. Info, they are calling it as informal data. Which means, less than companies where less than 10 people are working. Here the companies where more than 10 people are working, so that data is called as a formal data. And here formal data they are collecting from the major se segments of the economy. Example, from manufacturing, how many the people are in manufacturing companies. So about the, 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 the demand driven data from manufacturing companies, construction company, 
from their companies, those in the trade business or in the hotels, restaurant or banking services, financial services, IT, uh, IT and IT enabled services like this. We take the data from the nine sectors of the economy and then we arrive at the employment data and then about the vacancy and then all those things. Then this also less than 10. Then we combine to this both the data together and then release as the data as a quarterly employment survey. So quarterly employment survey, it gives the demand perspective of the economy regarding the employment, unemployment. This gives a supply side perspective and these two things are based on the earlier method, usual principal status, current weekly status, daily status we are not following. Okay, annual annual angle we follow the, uh, follow the, uh, they follow the first one called as a uh, usual principal status. For the quarterly angle, we follow the current weekly status. Daily, we are not following in our economy. That also you can mention. We are not following in our country. So, these are the uh, methods. We are following in this two, two different kinds of data. Earlier, we are having only this data in our economy. But now, we are also having this data. Having the two data will help our policy makers to bridge the data deficit of our economy. Earlier, we were having the data deficit. What was the data deficit we are having? We are having the demand side data, which was not available. But now, we ha as we have the data, we are able to bridge the data in our economy. So, it will do a supporting role to our policy makers. Then you can write about the last part of the question. What is the last part? Suggest improvements. This is about the methodology. Now, we can write about the suggest improvements. What are the improvements? Though the data are released in demand angle, supply angle, the frequency of data we are getting once in a quarter. Now, only we are getting in quarter. And that is also not regularly released. And then, okay, and then we are getting only in annual angle. So, that there is a time lag is there. But other Western economies, they are able to release on a monthly basis. They are able to get the data on the, 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 the data at a shorter frequency. But now we are not able to get the data in a shorter frequency. The frequency is, a, is, a, is a, the duration is longer in India. This duration should be reduced in our economy. So that this will become a vital tool to our policy makers. So and then the reference period, okay, which we use is one year. And then one week, we take into account one hour. Okay, we must go. We, there we must adopt the current daily status also. For that, how we collect the data? This data collection mechanism must become more robust, okay, must, uh, must be more reliant, okay, and then it should be more appropriate, it must be more, more, more relevant. So, in this angle, you just, you can write some, uh, you can write some suggestions. After writing the suggestions, okay, and give a conclusion. So, in measuring the unemployment, so earlier, we are relying only on the supply side, but now we have taken steps in the uh, right direction by collecting data in the uh, demand side also. Combining both data, okay, so India can measure the unemployment, but there are some hurdles in data measurement also, which must be addressed by the government in the near future. Like this, you can give a conclusion. So, this is about the answer for the question number three. So, write about the sexual unemployment, then write about the methodology. So, usual principal status, current weekly status, daily status, then write about the, the improvements. What improvements? We data, data is getting, we are hearing a lagged manner. The data lag must be addressed, frequency must be increased. In this angle, then you give a conclusion. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, excuse me. In between, we had a technical glitch. Okay, now let's continue. Okay, so here uh, we, we should write about how the uh, care economy can be monetized with the help of SIGs. So, SIGs, how the SIGs can generate the, can provide the income earning opportunities to the woman. You write about this, this point. Then you write about, okay, this is about SIG. But apart from the self-help groups also, how the women, they can become the entrepreneurs in the economy. How they can start their own business. How they can start their own enterprises. Not based on the uh, SAG model. Based on the individual model. How they can become the entrepreneurs in the economy. Here you write about the how the women entrepreneurship can be developed so that the women, they can come forward and they can start their own daycare activities. They can start their own education centers. In this angle, or they can provide the healthcare services to their people or how they can run the old age homes. Not based on SAG model, same economic activity point. But here you write as a, how they can be promoted as a own and as a self-employed entrepreneurs in the economy. Like this, you can write about the next point. And here also you can mention about the uh, we have a, a grant by the central government known as called as a, a Nari Shakti grant. How the Nari Shakti funds can be used for promoting the women entrepreneurship in the economy. In this angle, you write about that point. Then, okay, in this way, you write about all these points. So, when we when you write all the points, here this side, you would have written some five points. So, earlier, you would have written some four or five points based on differences. So, totally combined together, these points are more than enough to complete a 15 marker in the examination. So, finally, you give a conclusion.
so the women they are the experts in giving the uh, care services to the uh, to in, in in the economy but the things are not properly rewarded things are not properly recognized but when we convert them okay through women empowerment when we convert them into the monetized angle so it will it will it, it it will serve the interest of the women and also serve the interest of the economy in this angle you can give a conclusion based on the way how you have drafted your points okay in this way you can complete this answer so with this we are finishing our discussion on uh, economics part thank you all part that we are going to discuss first starting with the concept of artificial intelligence in very simple terms so it refers to the simulation of human intelligence uh, so that the machines are programmed to think and act like humans so here acting and thinking it includes uh, reasoning or thinking capabilities and then data processing all together if the machines are going to mimic the human intelligence or if machines are going to perform something that generally requires human intervention if the machines are going to automatically perform something which requires human interference all these are counted as artificial intelligence it's a wide spectrum there are different definitions available so you have to fill at least one or two definitions uh, at least for 30 or 40 words and then followed by that next one we have to discuss how artificial intelligence helps in clinical diagnosis the first one artificial intelligence helps in image analysis because radiography is a individual uh, stream of medical science wherein they uh, take uh, ct scans or mri scans or x rays and based on that they make a clinical diagnosis wherein such image analysis is going to be revolutionized by artificial intelligence because ai especially machines may be capable of processing more data than humans and because of that the image analysis concept is going to be improvised then the second one predictive analysis which means even before symptoms occur Uh, based on the images or based on the data anomalies the artificial intelligence may be capable of predicting any any illness that may occur at a later stage and then we will talk about natural language processing which means if you are going to provide the artificial intelligence model with a lot of clinical data let's say patient data after anonymizing obviously but if you are going to give the patient data to the uh, artificial intelligence through natural lang language processing it can derive a lot of uh, patterns uh, for example if you're going to give data related to diabetes patients a lot of data then it can derive what are the probable uh, health problems that may arise depending on the data variations so what if someone is having uncontrolled sugar and what if someone is trying to regulate the sugar what are the possible health conditions that may occur for uh, someone with uncontrolled diabetes and then controlled diabetes so all such can be processed with uh, the natural language processing and then about data integration that is various uh, data uh, can be integrated and then based on that analysis can be performed for example a fitness tracker or chest straps that's capable of uh, recording different fitness data say heart rate or uh, heart rate variations or change in skin temperature so all such data can be integrated into a single model and based on which uh, the clinical diagnosis can be improvised and then treatment recommendations even though doctors do this the artificial intelligence also can give treatment recognitions or recommendations based on the input taken from the doctors because it's more like a learning process wherein the ai model learns how the treatment is suggested based on the uh, anomalies so based on that even artificial in intelligence can start giving recommendations for the treatments so these are the way by which artificial intelligence can improvise or drastically change the way by which medical diagnosis is going to help uh, or going to work now coming to the next one how uh, the, the third portion do you perceive it as a threat so first we have to discuss what are the problems related to artificial intelligence especially in the medical field first i would say privacy concerns related to data security because a massive amount of data is going to be stored by the hospitals so what if there are data breaches and what if sensitive data related to the individual leaks outside this is the first and the primary concern related to artificial intelligence in the healthcare coming to the next one concern that is so patients may not be fully aware of what uh, data has been given to the artificial intelligence so even though you may be getting a concern uh, from the patient wherein the patients do not generally do not have the control over how much data is exposed or how much data is given to the artificial intelligence it's basically a thin line between uh, you know learning and a lot of data being given to the artificial intelligence so concern is going to be a main concern then followed by that bias and inequity that is 
this bias factor is applicable for all the field including the medical field because artificial intelligence is learning or AI models are learning only based on the data that we provide. So, what if the data fed to the artificial intelligence models have a very high bias? Then there is a possibility that it can give wrong information also. The suggestions could go wrong. So, bias and inequality will help to train the artificial intelligence systems. And if the data given to them are biased, then it can lead to misdiagnosis or sometimes it can even lead to wrong treatments. It can lead to misdiagnosis and it leads to wrong treatment because the training data determines if the information is going to be right or wrong. And then the other concern surrounding artificial intelligence in medical field, next is anonymization challenges. That is, even though you may be removing the name of the patient and everything from the record before feeding it to the artificial intelligence, still they are smart enough. Sometimes it can uh, reverse track it to a particular patient. So, in case of any data breach happening, the hackers or any other unlawful uh, agencies may be able to get the actual detail of the patient. So, anonymization challenges is there, especially in reproductive health care and other cases, this is going to be a greater concern. And then, dependency on AI systems, that is because this makes the health system vulnerable. Because too much of dependence on artificial intelligence and machine based systems. So, in case of outage, say a server outage or say a artificial intelligence model is not working, then a lot of activities can be hampered. So, too much of dependence on AI is not always good. So, it has to be used with the, in an optimum uh, level. And followed by that, you can conclude by giving, you know, the privacy concerns are there, but there should be a strict government regulation. And also, uh, the medical agency or the doctor should be able to control what is the data fed to the artificial intelligence models. Like that, you can give a conclusion and it can be concluded. Coming to the second question, uh, several ways in which microorganisms can help in current uh, fuel shortage. So, they have given the term several ways, which means you can talk about bioethanol, biodiesel production, multiple things can be discussed here. First, we are going to talk about bioethanol production. So, bioethanol production, certain strains of yeast or certain strains of bacteria, they can ferment and uh, especially broken food grains or solid waste from the market or what we call as uh, lignocellulosic biomass. All these can be used for producing bioethanol. So, bioethanol can be blended with normal petrol or even there are engines that can run on uh, complete ethanol. You have flex fuel vehicles. For example, recently uh, Marthi Wagner or few uh, companies manufactured the flexible fuel vehicle. So, you can use it for mixing this uh, E10 fuel or E85 fuel or even 100 percent ethanol can be. Coming to the next one, biodiesel. So, the main difference between bioethanol and biodiesel is uh, first it depends on the microorganism used. Uh, so, if you have a proper data, then you should mention or otherwise you should not mention. For example, you take bioethanol production. So, Saccharomyces, these are the class of bacteria which are generally used here for bioethanol production. So, coming to biodiesel production. So, biodiesel production generally includes uh, usage of uh, microalgae. We can use yeast and also bacteria can be used. Wherein generally here, lipids are used for deriving biodiesel. When we say lipid, it includes fats, cholesterol, which can be found in uh, used cooking oil. So, you can, you can use the used cooking oil and everything, which can be used for producing biodiesel production. So, it becomes uh, at least a carbon neutral one. And then, biohydrogen production. So, hydrogen is a promising fuel. There are different methods by which hydrogen can be produced. So, there are steam reforming and different methods. But here, since they are talking about uh, microbes, you can write Clostridium and then there are class of uh, Enterobacter. These class of bacteria, they are capable of producing uh, biohydrogen through different fermentative process. And then methane production, the most important one, methane production. Again, uh, the vegetable waste, 
generally whenever there is anaerobic respiration that is organic breakdown happening in deficient supply of oxygen or maybe absence of oxygen whenever anaerobic respiration happens it emits phosphine phosphine is a toxic gas along with it a lot of methane will be emitted so these methane can be used as a fuel so biogas production biohydrogen production and then synthetic biology for advanced fuels so the reason we have used synthetic biology here is we can modify the organisms you can genetically modify the organisms so such organism can help for better extraction of fuel or sometimes they can help for production of fuel also so under the synthetic uh, one you can write uh, certain types of estercia coli a certain type of yeast can be genetically engineered or they can be modified for producing biofuels and then one important thing here is direct microbial fuel cell that is to know the basics of fuel cell if you want to write this so when in fuel cell there will be a cathode and there will be anode uh, if you take a normal fuel cell on one side we will be feeding hydrogen when on the other side we will be feeding oxygen which is taken from the atmosphere both of them mixed together and then they start producing uh, water the so the moment of electrons will produce electricity wherein the by product or output of this will be only water so similar to that in this case in case of di direct microbial fuel cells microbes can be used for producing hydrogen and that can be used for uh, operating the fuel cell the biggest advantage here is the output is going to be only h2 you are getting electricity by the movement of electrons and also the emission will be only in form of greenhouse gases and though that to very minimal amount of greenhouse gases so direct microbial fuel cell is a potential application by which you can reduce uh, the dependence on fossil fuels and then enhanced oil recovery so these are new techniques where extraction of oil from the wells it can be increased by using certain microbes this is not a alternative technology but in the existing technology when you are trying to extract uh, oil from the wells you can use enhanced oil recovery technique wherein certain bacteria or certain other microbes can help for a increased extraction of the oil sources i will show all the facts once again first is about bioethanol production we are using yeast bacteria and everything for uh, extracting uh, ethanol from food grains this one it includes lipids which means uh, used cooking oil and everything and then biohydrogen it uses clostridium or enterobacter and then methane it is from anaerobic respiration which which includes solid waste or any other biomass and then synthetic biology uh, like superbugs which is used for remediation of oil spills similar to that we can design microbes which can help us to produce more fuel and then direct microbial fuel cell where uh, you are making the electrons to move from one uh, electrode to the other electrode but by using hydrogen which may be produced by the microbes and then you have enhanced oil recovery techniques where the efficiency of oil extraction is increased so these are the methods by which shortage of fuel can be mitigated using the microbes so this is a 10 mark question we have given enough points where you have to come present right it coming to the 15 mark question the option of electric vehicle is rapidly uh, growing worldwide how do electric vehicles contribute to reducing the emissions and the, what are the key benefits they offer compared to the uh, traditional engines that is the internal combustion engines so in this case so here this is just a statement we are not going to write anything about this then how do electric vehicles contribute to reducing the carbon emission this is one question and then what are the key benefits compared to internal combustion engines which means first you should understand how a internal combustion engine works and then you have to understand how a electric vehicle works and then based on that you have to make a comparison you can innovate you can put tabular columns diagrams or anything and based on that you have to explain it wherein the biggest portion of there are two parts has to be addressed first one and second one what are the key benefits and what are the differences first we will learn about the differences when you take a normal uh, petrol or a diesel based vehicle uh, the engines they have pistons and the, when the, when the piston is going to compress the fuel and air mixture it can be petrol or a diesel when fuel plus air mixture is compressed the pressure increases and then the temperature increases and because of that the fuel burns the fuel ignites and burns so the combustion of the fuel delivers power the, generally we have four stroke engines wherein we have four different cycles through which the fuel is drawn inside and then the combustion happens so this power is delivered to the crankshafts and then it rotates the wheel this is generally how a normal ice that is a internal combustion engine works when what are the things needed here first you need a engine and then you have to fill the fuel here fuel is compressed burnt whenever the fuel burns you call it as a internal combustion engine 
wherein if you take electric vehicles, you are going to store electricity in battery packs, wherein these battery packs, they are connected to the electric traction motors, wherein these motors are almost directly attached to the wheels. There are different methods by which they couple the motors along with the wheels, but in most of the cases, the motors are directly attached to the wheels like this. So, the primary difference that we see here is, this contains, this does not need a fuel refilling, but it takes a longer time. We are going to make a rough comparison between internal combustion engines and the electric vehicles. Prefer to do it in form of a tabular column. On left hand side, we are going to have internal combustion engines, right hand side electric vehicles. We are going to compare internal combustion engines and electric vehicles. So, in this case, when we say the power train, we call it as a internal combustion engine. The power train for this is said to be battery. First, we will start with the cost. That is, initial cost is going to be lesser for internal combustion engine. Uh, cost in the sense, we are talking about cost of the vehicle itself. When electric vehicles are definitely costly. Yeah. If you are looking for a good electric vehicle with at least a 500 kilometer range, minimum you have to spend around uh, 20 lakh rupee at least, Tata X1 for example. So, wherein internal combustion engines are reliable and also they have been there in the market for a very long time, we have competitive pricing starting from 4 or 5 lakh, you have internal combustion engines. Next one, when we talk about specific energy that is specific energy of fuel. How much energy can be derived from a fuel for 1 kilogram fuel? In that case, specific energy of fuel is high for internal combustion engines, wherein specific energy will be low for electric vehicles. Coming to the next one, the main problem here is it emits a lot of toxic substances. which includes greenhouse gases and other uh, heavy metals, sulfur, all these will be emitted when in this case nearly or almost nil emission. We call it as no tail pipe emission, which means in the exhaust pipe you are not going to have any smoke or any form of gas coming out. Uh, maybe in uh, fuel cell based electric vehicles, you will have small droplets coming out, that is all. When other than that, it is almost having nil emission coming to the next one. Next page. When we talk about range, usually I am just generalizing it based on the present market situation, wherein the range of the internal combustion engines is going to be higher. If you are going to fill one tank, you can easily travel say 400 or 500 kilometers very easily, wherein the range of electrical vehicles are comparatively lesser. Cost for the range is going to be lesser. but when we talk about the cost per kilometer or the operation cost, the operational cost for this one is going to be higher, wherein the operational cost for electric vehicles is much lower. If you take smaller vehicles such as uh, the MG Comet and everything, uh, they promise that you can drive or you only have to spend. 50 rupees per kilometer, not rupee, 50 pies per kilometer if you take a smaller vehicle. Maybe if you have a larger vehicle, it depends on the electricity cost and everything, but generally based on a weighted average, for smaller electric vehicles, you are going to spend only half rupee per kilometer. Maybe for luxurious vehicles, you will be spending around 2 to 3 rupee per kilometer. But if you take an internal combustion engine, it is definitely going to be much, much costlier. Coming to the next one, maintenance cost. Here, the maintenance cost is high. And here, the maintenance cost is low because we are minimizing the number of rotating components inside and because of that, uh, definitely internal combustion engines have more expenses since you have clutch plates, a gearbox and everything, wherein in electric vehicles, it is just a dial, just shifting between the power output, uh, you know, you put it in a sports mode or eco mode or city mode or something, that is all. Wherein here, the mechanism is more complicated, especially in manual vehicles, the clutch plates and different assemblies, mechanical depreciation is much higher for internal combustion engine compared to a electrical vehicle and then, but one strategic advantage here is refilling time. 
the refilling time for any type of fuel is going to be lesser, wherein here the recharging time is going to be higher. Wherein the in terms of efficiency, generally this has lesser efficiency because if you have studied a proper physics, there is something called as Carnot engine. Even for Carnot engine, the efficiency out of the stored power, the efficiency will be roughly around 30 percent, 30 percent itself is maximum. Carnot engine is ideal engine, you cannot build a Carnot engine. So, remember Carnot engine is hypothetical, it is only theoretical not actual engine. So, even for Carnot engine the efficiency is going to be somewhere around 30 percent, but if you take electric vehicles the efficiency can be up to 80 percentage because of this. No doubt strategically the advantage is more for electric vehicles that is why the mobility is slowly moving towards uh, electric vehicles from the internal combustion engine. So, what are the parts we have addressed right now? The first important thing how electric vehicle, uh, so this one the key benefits they offer compared to the traditional internal combustion engine that part is addressed. Then next we are going to talk about uh, how electric vehicles contribute to reduction in carbon emission for that first important thing is zero tailpipe emission since it is not going to emit any uh, toxic gases including uh, carbon monoxide or greenhouse other greenhouse gases almost nil tailpipe emission. You can write multiple things from here since there is no tailpipe emission India will gain carbon credit. Since we are gaining carbon credit this will help us to fulfill the commitments given under Paris climate agreement. You can link it with the you know intended nationally determined contributions all these can be linked here and then high energy efficiency we have discussed now that uh, compared to the Carnot engine or the ideal engines internal combustion engines the energy efficiency is going to be much higher and then reduced fossil fuel dependence you can import reduced import of crude oil if, re if the crude oil import is going to be reduced it is going to be better on the forex reserves also and then regenerative braking a very familiar technique from which we have been expecting question prelims for a longer time wherein when you apply brake the kinetic energy is going to be reduced and it is going to be dissip going to dissipate as heat in the brake pads. Wherein in electric vehicles when you take your uh, legs off from the pedal then the car tires are spinning correct. The spinning tire acts as a generator more like when you take uh, the pedal from the accelerator your legs from the accelerator pedal I repeat when you take your legs from the accelerator pedal then the rotating wheel starts uh, slowing down by uh, running as a generator. So, which means when you take your legs off from the pedal, the wheel spins, it generates electricity and that will be re used for recharging the battery that is what you call as regenerative braking. That is the energy lost during braking will be converted into electricity and stored back inside and that is why if you take electric vehicle to uphill you will lose range, but when you come downhill with a strong regen braking you will be gaining range. It is more like a, a dynamo running wherein it gains more electricity. So, regenerative braking is another advantage increases the efficiency also and then cost saving that is the initial setup cost may be high, but for someone who regularly uses car uh, definitely electrical vehicles are is going to be cost saving. Second quiet operation the biggest advantage compared to the diesel vehicles irrespective of the uh, even the costlier diesel vehicles after certain kilometers they start making noise because the diesel engines are larger and the compression ratio is also higher for the diesel engines and because of that they turn noisier over time wherein if you take electric vehicles since only the motor is operating which is directly driving the vehicle it is not going to cause much of vibration and it is also not going to cause any noise and then reduced heat emission since the engines generate a lot of heat they are not the, the concept of engine oil itself is not here. You do not have uh, coolants or anything you have certain amount of coolants only for the battery packs. So, since the he oil is not getting heated inside it reduces the heat emission from the vehicle which may transmit inside the cabin also and then health benefits because since you are reducing emission you are you are uh, improving the air quality. Since air quality is improved respiratory disorders will be reduced that is burden on the government will be reduced. So, it has a lot of health benefits also if you are adopting a non polluting or a less polluting uh, method of mobility compared to the internal combustion engines no doubt it has a health benefit. 
not only for owner but for the general public also and then integration with renewable energy if you have a choice to integrate it with the renewable energy then it is going to be even more beneficial it will have carbon negative or maybe carbon neutral method of transport right we have completed three questions coming to the fourth question so what is the main task of india's third moon mission uh, which could not be achieved in the earlier mission which means they are saying Chandrayaan 2 could not achieve certain objectives which was achieved by Chandrayaan 3. What are those objectives? That is the first part of the question. Second one, list the countries that have achieved this task. The second one, you have to write few uh, data related to that. And the third one, what is the role of virtual launch control center at Vikram Sarabhai Space Center which is located in Trivandrum uh, and how it contributed to the successful launch of uh, Chandrayaan from Shiarikota. So, you have to write about three important ones wherein First, we will talk about this. What is the main task of India's uh, lunar third lunar mission, Chandrayaan 3? We all know that uh, Chandrayaan was uh, mainly sent to demonstrate the lander and rover. Along with that, we wanted to perform certain in situ experiments. That is, we wanted to test the soil composition. We wanted to learn about the temperature on the moon and everything. So, I put it in different points here. Three main objectives. First one is engineering and implementing a lander, which was named as Vikram and especially to make a soft landing on the surface of the moon. The next one is observing and demonstrating the rover, which was named as the Pragyan, meaning knowledge and its drive capabilities on the moon and followed by that, conducting and observing experiments on the materials available on the lunar surface. This is what I told you, in situ experiment. So, if it is in situ experiment, what will be the exit experiment? If, a, if the mission is a sample and return mission, that is if it is going to drill a sample or a scoop a amount of sample and then if it is going to return to earth, we call it as an exit experiment. In this case, we had an in situ analysis. These three are the primary tasks of uh, Chandrayaan mission, wherein all the three tasks are successful for now. Wherein still we are, uh, when we are recording this, we are trying to establish one more connection uh, with the rovers and landers which are inactive right now. So, please, please update it. But, but in any way, when you were writing mains, all the two were active. So, because of that, India's uh, objective was successful. And coming to the next one, the list of countries that achieved it. When you talk about lunar landing, there are certain facts that you can furnish here. First one, uh, when we talk about landing, the first landing or the first lunar lander is called uh, Luna 9. This was sent by uh, USSR. The first lunar lander was Luna 9, which was sent by the former Soviet Union. And then the first lunar rover was called uh, Luno Code, which was also sent by USSR. USSR has or USSR has a significant or certain good records, especially in lunar missions. In fact, the most number of lunar missions was sent by USSR. Here yeah, we have written it as most number of lunar missions, but we are not talking about the success failure or anything. Generally, most number of lunar missions it is by USSR. Then followed by that, when we talk about the most successful country, we have to talk about two things. First is highest uh, success rate in lunar landing. The highest success rate in lunar landing contrary to the popular uh, opinion it is not USA, it is actually China because they have written highest success rate. Rate means in terms of percentage, China has uh, had sent uh, three missions that is Changi 3, Changi 4, and Chang E5. All the three missions were successful. So, right now China is boasting 100 percent success rate in lunar landing. But when we talk about most number of uh, successful landings, that would be USA. So, when they ask the question like what are the other countries that have achieved this speed, since it is the main question, we can put three or four significant facts. First lunar lander, Russia. First lunar rover, Russia. Most number of missions, Russia. Highest success rate, China. Most number of uh, landings, USA. And altogether, countries that had uh, landed on moon, only four countries. Russia was the first to soft land, followed by USA, 
followed by China, followed by India. India is the fourth country to land successfully on the moon. Wherein, if you talk about the attempts, totally five countries have attempted. Wherein, Israel, they sent a mission called as uh, Berry Sheet. It was the same year, 2019, when we sent Chandrayaan 2, Israel sent Berry Sheet. This was a failure. So, out, out of five countries that have attempted, four countries are successful right now. India was the fourth country to perform successful landing near the south pole of the moon. It is not on the south pole, but near the south pole of the moon. Now, two parts of the question has been addressed. Coming to the third part, a minor part in fact, what, what was the role of uh, virtual launch control center? Understand, virtual launch control center primarily it was uh, operationalized or it was uh, improvised during the COVID time. Because we are not able to mobilize a lot of scientists during the COVID time to a particular location. So, we like a hub and spoke model, we integrated multiple launch centers and multiple centers of ISRO to a single point called as the virtual launch control center. Now, what are the primary functions of the virtual launch control center? So, the role of virtual launch control center, we can write four important roles here. First one is, it acted as a all the systems that were present in Sri Arikota, including the launch vehicles, everything was virtually simulated in the virtual uh, launch control center. Understand the virtual launch control center is located in Tumba, which is located in Trivandrum in Kerala. So, we replicated or more like we created a virtual environment similar to the uh, Satish Dhawan Space Center in Sri Arikota. And because of that, the scientists were able to perform a lot of simulations using the replicas. This was the first one. Second one, it helped in better human resource management. Since all these things were simulated, it does not uh, require the scientists to travel to different uh, ISRO centers. The bulk transportation of scientists were not required. When all the tests needed were performed in the virtual launch control center, and then all the anomalies were checked, and based on that, the appropriate actions were taken in uh, Sri Arikota. So, the simulation was happening in Kerala, but appropriate actions were taken in Sri Arikota. That was the second one. And third one, safety. In case of any unlikely events, uh, mission abort uh, systems or uh, any other automated uh, steps that has to be taken to fix the errors, all these were tested using the virtual launch control system located in Sri Arikota, wherein yeah. this ensured safety of the mission and also it increased the confidence on the mission. Since we ran multiple checks before actually launching the mission, it increased confidence of India in the third lunar mission. And coming to the fourth important thing, it helped in real time monitoring. of the entire program. So, in fact, uh, the Chandrayaan 3 launch, uh, we had a lot of onboard computers which was performing the tasks automatically. So, how we were able to automate most of the task means, first of all, we simulated them and then based on that, we built computers capable of handling any unforeseen circumstances and then we were monitoring it from the ground. So, most of the mission uh, launching and everything, it was automated. So, all these were achieved by the contributions from the virtual launch control center located in Thumba. So, in fact, this is this can be kept as a minor part. Maximum for 70 or 80 words, you can write this. This can be filled for around 80 words. And then the introduction part along with the rules, this can be filled for 250 words. So, this is how these questions had to be addressed. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to you all. So, we will discuss some of the UPSC 2023 mains question. So, GS3 environment questions. So, question 1, what is oil pollution? What are its impact on marine ecosystem? 
in what way oil pollution is particularly harmful for the uh, country like India. So it is around uh, 150 words, uh, 10 marks, so two sides. So it has got three part. What is oil pollution? What are its impact on marine ecosystem? And how it will affect India? So the first part, directly we can go to the question first part. Oil pollution, it is nothing but any liquid form of an oil or crude oil or sort of a, a petrol that is spilled on an ecosystem by the human activity. Most of the time, it is from the marine, so marine oil spill, but sometimes it also includes the uh, land oil spill also that leaches into the wetlands. And apart from this, oil spill can also happen, oil pollution can also happen by natural disaster. Suppose some other, somewhere the oil spill happen in some other country because of the tsunami or because of the cyclone also, the oil pollution can happen. So this is a basic introduction you can give. And then what are its impact? So come to the key points. So the first and foremost impact, I can say it is oil weathering. See, when the oil spill happens on a marine, especially on the marine ecosystem, uh, the oil will obey the Pascal law of transmissibility. It will travel for a long distance. By that way, it will soak, it will form like a foam. Normally, we call it a metal oil weathering. Uh, that will block your sunlight. That will also reduce your oxygen intake. And at the same time, that will also make the water dark under. So by that way, the ecosystem is affected. Number two, the key point is, it is the ingestion. See, many animals consume this oil. Normally, this oil will contain some harmful chemical like PAH, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon, benzene, formaldehyde, even it also contains some sulfur. So, these are all very harmful. So, if you take a PAH and all, it is a carcinogen, mutagen and teratogen and other also affects the system. So, in what way, when it is ingested by a dolphin or whales or fishes, in what way it affects it? The one, when it goes to the liver, it enlarges the liver. It also affects the cardiovascular system and it even, it changes the respiration system. And apart from that, finally, eventually, it will lead to a death. So, that is the second key point you have to write. The third key point you can mention about the uh, hypothermia. Normally, when the organism is covered by the oil, if you take uh, any birds and all, what happens? You see, the thermal uh, transfer will get affected. By that way, the internal body heat will increase and finally, it will enter into hypothermia. By that way, the organ failure will happen. The organism will die. That's the third key point you can go for. The fourth key point, you can also go for this. The oil will also enter into the deep. See, most of the time the oil will float on the water, but sometimes what happens, you see, because of the pressure or because of the oil on the water surface go thinner and thinner, will become lighter and some will enter into the deeper. When it enters into the deeper, the question is where it enters. Suppose by chance if in the middle of the ocean, so it will, its impact is a little different, but whereas if it is in the continental shelf, especially in the littoral zone, that oil will go and affect the coral, important ecosystem like mangroves, and even seagrass bed. And finally, it will reduce the biodiversity or it will completely shatter the biodiversity. So these are the key points we can mention about in the oil spill that impacts on the marine ecosystem. The third part is in what way the oil particularly harmful or affects a country like India. The first and foremost thing, especially the oil spill happens near the coastal. When you take Andaman Nicobar or Gulf of Mannar, so whichever the major coastal ecosystem, our coral reefs, mangroves, everything will affect it, will get affected. And you know that 25% of the marine organism is directly or indirectly supported by the corals. And if you come, if you take 90% of the marine organism is supported by the coastal ecosystem. By chance, if the oil is going to be the coastal ecosystem, it is going to have a huge impact on our biodiversity, especially our Indian biodiversity, coastal biodiversity. That is point number one. Point number two, our fishing will get affected. Because some of the commercial fishes definitely will get affected by this oil spill. That's the second point. The third point, you can talk about the tourism. So when oil spill happen, naturally the tourism activity, no one will come for the tourism. The tourism activity also will get impacted. That's the third key point. The fourth key point, it also affects the power plant. If you take many power plants, take water from the ocean. 
suppose if it is switched to the oil definitely when the oil goes with the water inside the power plants and all the power plant will got the power plant the system the heat transfer system will get detroited that, that is another key point the last key point you can also see when oil spill happen when the volunteers go most of the time the environmental activists they go for a cleaning they are exposed to this oil this oil definitely will have as i told you it has got polyaromatic hydrocarbon benzene sulfur so these volunteer is also getting affected and the final is when the oil spill especially in the coastal region when the air moves on it also enter as a air pollutant some of the particulate matter of benzene sulfur goes as air pollution the coastal people will get affected and if it is nearby the ground well so definitely groundwater leaching is also getting affected so these are the impacts we have on the indian ecosystem or on the indian country so finally conclusion what you can make is if you see the disaster management especially for the oil spill we are comparatively little weaker so right now we are developing bio remediation and all so in as there is and also there is no separate law or sort of framework to control the oil spill so we have a sort of a contingency plan and uh, it is indirectly mentioned in the rep act so india has to strengthen its law especially for the oil spill so especially in terms of uh, compensation in terms of prevention we have to go for and at the same time we also should should strengthen in case of a disaster we should strengthen our disaster management techniques so these are the key points we can mention in this first question oil spill come to the second question comment on national wetland conservation program initiated by the government of india and i name a few india's wetland of international importance included in the ramsar site so two part the first part is we have to explain about the national wetland conservation program so what are the uh, since it's a 250 words 15 mark so you have to tell what are the basic provisions of this particular wetland conservation plan and comment you have to give a opinion so you have to tell what is the benefit of it and at the same time what are the cons and the second part we have to explain some of the ramsar sites so at least minimum 7 if you are able to mention 10 ramsar site that will be better or 5 ramsar site with little elaboration also will be better so here the first one is when you come to the national wetland conservation program actually today we don't have this program in this name we have a program npca that is called national plan for conservation of aquatic ecosystem the reason is the national wetland conservation program has been merged with national lake conservation plan because many duplication is happening sometimes many wetlands or lakes many wetland lakes or wetlands so that is the reason in order to reduce the duplication in 2013 itself we brought a national npca that is national plan for conservation of aquatic ecosystem and come to the wetland so two or three benefits of wetland you can write about because wetland is a very important productive ecosystem it supports rich biodiversity it is a kidney function and also it is also called as a nature supermarket so some four five benefits of wetland we have to say because why we need to have such a program why we need to conserve so i will say that four points will be better the one is a it is a supermarket natural supermarket it is a kidney function and it supports biodiversity and also it is a very important productive ecosystem okay coming to this program uh, so the program concentrates on the holistic protection of wetland number 2 to make the state more vigilant about the conservation of wetland and number 3 the center will provide a guideline for all the states uniform guideline for all the states to conserve the wetland and number 4 is to give a priority for the very important wetlands especially like ramsar sites and most important identified wetland and at the same time the next one is to monitor the program and also periodically report to the central government and keep on developing the particular wetland so these are the basic objective under this plan national npca so we have uh, two type two broad uh, perspective the one is the management action plan so how to manage or conserve the wetland and number two is on the research projects because we have to develop the research then only the wetland can be well conserved so this is a two major aspect now this program whatever the program we have the national plan for conservation of aquatic ecosystem it is a center state combined funding method okay so now come to the next second one uh, comment so comment part so when you come to the comment part so first if you see the advantages of this program anyway we have identified some of the wetland which is very important second is we have also 
by conserving that wetland, especially on controlling the pollution, controlling the industrial waste, controlling the sewage, even conserving that particular wetland, we have conserved the biodiversity in that wetland. That is a second major one. And we have improved the water quality because of the groundwater quality is also improved. That is, it has, you know, done its kidney job function. That is also another thing. And through this program also, in many wetlands, we have made the community to engage and also we have increased the livelihood for the local community because the Ramsar criteria, very important criteria itself is conserving a wetland is important. At the same time, the local people involvement, the local people livelihood, it should support. So these function or these aspects was included in the wetland conservation program. And apart from that, we are also able to identify and make some of the wetlands as a international importance. That is nothing but Ramsar. And this program also very helpful for achieving our Ramsar objective, which India has signed in the uh, Ramsar in the UNESCO. So these are the some of the advantages, I will say, because of this program. So we have got more awareness and other thing. Now, disadvantages. So that's very important part. So if you see wetland, uh, even though we have this program, there are some disadvantages. Now, first coming to the data, if you see, according to the uh, ISRO, there can be more than two lakh water bodies we may have across India. And in this, if you see a wetland portal, India or India wetland portal, it is identified anywhere around 1,255 wetlands approximately we have. But in this 1,255, some of the significant wetland is only 115 that's covered under the program and 75 Ramsar sites we have. So if you see anywhere around 1,050 plus wetland, there is no focus. So we are not giving a focus for all the wetland. That is one. Number two is... Uh, Collecting all the wetland, especially, you know, the data collection of the wetland through the remote sensing is also little weaker we have. And also identifying the biodiversity also, it is not done completely. That is the second thing we have. The third one is uniform implementation by the states. See, all the states is not uniformly implementing the wetland. If you see some states and all, I can say it is very advanced, especially like Chilika Lake and all. The, wet, the Odisha government is doing an excellent job. Today, Chilika Lake, sometimes we call it as a model wetland lake. And many wetland conservation activists say that all the lake should come like a equivalent to a Chilika lake or all the Ramsar sites should come or all the Ramsar sites or lake should come to like a Chilika lake because the reason is Chilika lake is well conserved. So if you see that whether the same level of conservation is happening in all the states may not be. That is the third important uh, thing we have. So we want the central government to insist on the state and the state government to take more responsibility on the wetland. And the fourth one is whether regular monitoring surveillance is happening. No, it is not happening in all the wetland. Only in few wetlands, regular monitoring is happening. And then the very important thing is a lot of exploitation of wetland. Still today, many, you can see many agencies are directly discharging the industrial waste into the wetland. Even the sewage is directly discharged. Lot of exploitation of wetland. And the next point is we are also converting the wetland especially for agriculture activity, even some wetlands are given for development activity and all. So that is another thing we find. And more important is more pollution, especially in industrial pollution, heavy metals is being discharged, especially in the wetland. Recently, we came to know that many wetlands, many lakes has got high toxin level of heavy metal. So these are not still controlled. And apart from that, only in few, in Ramsar sites and few sites only, the local people participation happens. In many sites, local people are not participated or sometimes local people exploit that particular wetland. So these are the some of the disadvantages we have in this program. And the last part, we have to explain about the wetland of international importance. So here are some of the important sites you can mention about Chilika Lake. So one of the best sites, even today, high yield of fishes, we can find the Chilika Lake. It is a model wetland. Bitter Kanika Lake, which is a very good mangrove site, which also have a high density of uh, crocodiles. We can find saltwater crocodile. And apart from that, nearby the Gahirmata Beach, which is a very important for the olive ridley turtle. The next one is the uh, uh, Kolleru, so which is a very important for uh, biodiversity. And we have one wetland, Boj wetland, even though it is a man-made, which was constructed very long back, Maharaja Boj, which is a land-made dam. But it's a very important for uh, biodiversity, especially for phytoplankton and zooplankton. The next comes the uh, uh, Sundarban, which is a very important mangrove site for Bengal tiger, which supports a lot of livelihood. And apart from that, the two, which is in the Montreal record, Loktak Lake, which is a world only 
uh, floating park in the world and Kiladeo National Park, which is very famous for Siberian cranes. Some of the few wetlands you can mention, one or two line about the uh, importance of the wetland also we can mention. So these are the key points should come in the question number two. The question number three, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has predicted a global sea level rise of about one meter by 2100. Uh, what would be its impact in India and other countries in the Indian Ocean region? Okay, so it's nothing but the sea level rise because of the climate change. Uh, so not necessarily you have to separate for India and the Indian Ocean. So you can make it as a single thing. Even if it is possible also, you can split it. So first is you can refer to the IPCC, a very important special report. That is a special report on the ocean and cryosphere, which has given more detail about the sea level rise, even the AR6 report. And also there is a recent WMO report also says about the sea level rise. So if you see the data wise, it seems that anywhere around, according to the Ministry of Science, India, it is around 1.7 mm per year. It is increasing. The sea level rise is increasing over the century. That's a data given by the Ministry of Science. And you can also find 3 meter sorry, three centimeter rise in one decade. So if this rate goes on, it will be five centimeter rise you can find in decade, which will result in approximately, sorry, which will result in, it is 17 meter inland. So five centimeter per decade, which will result in 300 meter of inland loss so this is a basic data very prime data that is given by the wmo even by the ministry of science so first one is you have to discuss about what is the impact of sea level rise or what is the reason sorry what is the reason of sea level rise so i'll say that the first 50 percent of the reason comes from the thermal expansion number two it is from the glacial melting number three from the greenland and other arctic and antarctic melting especially from the indian ocean side it is a antarctic melting now whether the glacial melting whether it is a main factor even the recent report says that glacial contribution from the glacial melting is not uh, is not as high as what we expected it is comparatively low so it is comparatively it is only it seems that the thermal expansion and the Antarctic melting seems to play a major role in the Indian Ocean rise. Okay, come to the directly come to the path. So, what are the uh, impact? So, we are going to find. So, we can break into many because India wise we have 7500 uh, approximately kilometer of coastline. So, the impact is going to be very tremendous. So, first one broad, you can make it as a broad heading and then you can little elaborate. That will be better. The first one is the coastal erosion. When the sea level rises, you know that the land loss will happen. I told you, you know approximately we can find 300 meter of uh, land loss will happen. That will impact the coastal community. In fact, it will also impact the agriculture. And it is also predicted that it will have we we will find anywhere around 1500 square kilometer of land loss land loss by 2050 so these are all comes out of the coastal erosion the second is increased flooding increased flooding so the low-lying coastal areas is going to get affected especially the deltas and all become more vulnerable and even the recent report told that chennai mumbai and even kolkata is going to be the highest vulnerability we are going to find where more severe flooding will happen normally when the flooding happens you know that diseases and other parameters also increases parallelly then comes the migration displacement and migration so as the ipcc reports that we will find a lot of climate refugee engro migrant so many people will get displaced, even Maldives and other countries also going to have a more impact. Maybe in another 100 years of time, Maldives may not be there. And Mauritius is also getting more impacted. And the next one is the saline intrusion. Saline intrusion, the saltwater intrusion. Whenever the saltwater intrudes, 
uh, you know that the ground well water is getting affected the drinking water is getting affected agriculture crop yield also will reduce and finally agriculture production is also comes down and in turn it will also affect your inland biodiversity okay the next one is threat to the infrastructures so normally when the sea level rise happens you can see the airports power plants even some of the roads buildings is going to have impact but even if the impact is also very less the maintenance cost also will increase more that's another impact and greatly it will affect the tourism and shipping industry and apart from that so it's not directly connected to the sea level rise when the sea level rise is happening because of the climate change marine heat waves also increases which will also have more concern for the biodiversity and also at the same time will have a concern for the people living in the coastal region because of the more evaporation and the more evaporation it will result in more climate change sorry more uh, you know the extreme weather events also can happen and finally coming to the biodiversity when the sea level rises happen definitely you can see the fishing activity will get affected coral reefs of course directly or indirectly the coral reefs is going to have an impact because the salinity level changes coral needs high salinity apart from that coral bleaching can also happen your fishing industry may also fall the total ecological balance will come down and finally the very prime producers primary producer for the ocean which is plankton also will get disturbed whether all the plankton wiped out no so it seems that the plankton level will change some planktons will reduce some other plankton will increase so always in a climate change we call it as a winners and losers so some will be winners you can see sometime the uh, harmful algae blooms or harmful plankton may increase or bioluminescence plankton increase the natural plankton may decline so these are the impact you can find apart from this the impact specifically if you see the island countries like small island country maldives and all as i told you it will change and the second thing is maritime disputes also can happen because when the sea level rises happen automatically the boundary maritime boundary will also change which is coming under the un clause that also have an impact and apart from that it will also have a thermohaline disruption so the thermohaline the heat and the saline because the salinity changes the heat changes because of the sea level rise that will also have a impact and many island country is going to get impact many island country is going to get submerged so these are the key points can come so finally when you conclude it so you can conclude that uh, the uh, under the un of triple c since the sea level rise we cannot stop it we can go for some adaptation and we can go for some mitigation so the loss and damage fund has to be increased for the vulnerable countries especially in the indian ocean most of the countries are poor country and developing country and apart from that more gcf fund should be directed towards adaptation and mitigation for the climate change and very important there is something called our indian prime minister has initiated cdri the coalition for disaster resilient infrastructure so at least in the island country in the coastal region the disaster resilient infrastructure has to be built in the coming near future so these are the key points you can discuss in the the third question that is the ipcc question okay thank you to all Hello everyone, I am Kanaga Raj, Faculty for Agriculture. So I will discuss the agriculture questions in our GS paper 3. So first question, uh, question number 3. So how does e-technology help farmers in production and marketing of agriculture products? Explain it. So this question is about the importance of e-technology in agriculture for production and marketing. So first we can give on a, the answer structure for this question. So an introduction, a general introduction. You can say the importance of the e-technology, the role of ICT, information and communication technology in agriculture. So the leveraging technology in agriculture is important for increasing uh, food production at the same time to double the farmer's income. So we can give this introduction. Then we can address the question okay, in two parts. So what are the e-technology, the sources available for increasing the production? Then second part of the question, marketing. So what are the tools available, the e-technology options available for promoting marketing? So we can give some specific examples in this question. So for increasing production, some of the, the initiatives taken by the government so first one is national e-governance plan in agriculture ngpa short form 
national e governance plan in agriculture so under this plan the central government is releasing funds to the state governments for use of modern technologies in agriculture for example uh, for implementing artificial intelligence in agriculture iot internet of things in agriculture and robotics use of robotics that is nothing but uh, farm machineries in agriculture then use of drones in agriculture so for these advanced technologies the government is releasing funds under the national e governance plan in agriculture right so here in the production area we can discuss with it. so what are the factors that promotes production so under this every in every factor we can give one example the government initiative so this is for uh, advancement in agriculture okay we can give the, give the small heading for every initiative so advancement in agriculture for increasing production so under the national e governance plan in agriculture we promote is, this technology in agriculture then the second one income support to the farmers to increase the production income support measure and already there is one famous scheme uh, run by the central government the pm kisan under the pm kisan the government is providing 6000 rupees cash subsidy to the farmers on an annual basis so the government launched a pm kisan app so with this app the farmers they can directly register in this app okay then increasing the production of horticultural crops so for the horticultural farmers there is a network project called hotnet hotnet so this network project under this project so financial assistance is provided to the farmers under the midh mission for integrated development of horticulture so this is one of the major program for the holistic development of horticulture so to provide to release fund under this scheme they are using a network project called hotnet so we can uh, use this example for the increasing production of the horticultural crops then income support measure to the farmers sorry uh, input subsidies input subsidies and application of inputs in agriculture so for increasing the production to provide the farmers the guidance or the advisories to the farmers in case of input there is a app called kisan suvidha so this kisan suvidha app that provides that gives advisories to the farmers regarding the the weather condition or uh, the market prices of various commodities then the prices of various inputs in agriculture then some of the advisory services are provided by the the kisan suvidha app and this is one of the important tool for the dissemination of information creating awareness among the farmers then in case of uh, soil health management so this is also important for increasing energy production so in the area of soil health management there is a soil health card soil health card app okay portal so the government establishes separate soil health card portal so under this portal the, the farmers they can track the soil samples the soil samples given for the soil testing so based on this uh, soil testing values they apply the fertilizers they provide inputs to the, the crop right <clears throat> then crop insurance so in the crop insurance sector crop insurance area there is one uh, project called yes yes tech
yes tech and this is for actually in the crop insurance area the insurance companies they calculate the yield they calculate the compensation amount based on the yield estimation so for the accurate yield prediction so we are using the project yes tech under the crop insurance scheme the pradhan mantri fasal bima yojana then one more uh, icri tool available kisan sarathi kisan sarathi again this is one of the digital multimedia platform developed by icar the apex institute for agriculture research in india indian council for agriculture research so they developed a project called kisan sarathi so under this they provide advisory service to the farmers so these are the various icri tools available e technology available to the farmers so in various actually the aim of this so in this question the content should be more diversified so here we discussed about the and the crop insurance sector in a income supporting measure then a soil health card then in, then a input areas so at least we can give okay so we have to raise, raise with the answer so we give one example at least one example for each category then we move to the marketing area so what are the e technology tools available for promotion of marketing so again one more uh, very famous scheme in the marketing area enam this scheme is actually uh, implemented by the launched by the ministry of agriculture and farmers welfare but currently this scheme is actually running by the the fund support is actually provided by the small farmers agri business consortium sfac small farmers agri business consortium so the government the scheme was launched in 2016 the main objective of this scheme is to ensure the the free flow of commodities and to network the existing apmc markets so the idea is to create a pan india market throughout india okay pan india electronic trading portal so that the farmers from uh, kashmir to kanyakumari they can trade their products in the portal so there is a enam scheme electronic national agriculture marketing it ensures smooth flow of the commodities from uh, throughout india moreover there is no interference of middlemen in the agriculture marketing right then one more uh, scheme agmark net in the marketing area one more tool available agmark net so this under the agmark net program actually this is the integration of the agriculture marketing scheme integration of agriculture marketing scheme so under the agmark net so here they provide support for the creation of agricultural marketing infrastructure creation of agriculture marketing infrastructure then in the procurement area there is one famous initiative by the ICT so where various the private um, companies okay the corporate companies are involved in the procurement of the products the ICT sorry okay ITC the indian tobacco corporation okay itc they launched a program called e chaupal so they involve okay under this program they directly they procure the products from the farmers then various uh, corporate companies even the tata tata chemicals they also involved in the marketing of the products and various uh, the multinational companies and the food processing companies they directly procure for products from the farmers so we can write okay those examples under the supply chain management so finally one conclusion so after giving the examples under the production and marketing area then we can conclude the question okay so the technology is important for the increasing the doubling of farmers income and this is the future of agriculture right <clears throat> so the government agencies especially the kvks krishi and kendras the agri extension agencies their main role is to create awareness among the farmers regarding the use of these e technologies to promote their income so like there we can conclude the question then the big question area 
So question number 13. Explain the changes in cropping pattern in India in the context of changes in consumption pattern and marketing conditions. So explain the changes in cropping pattern in the context of consumption pattern and marketing conditions. So this question is about factors affecting cropping pattern. So what are the factors affecting the cropping pattern in India? So here the question is very specific to the factors. There are various factors affecting cropping pattern. So first of all, the cropping pattern means the proportion of area under various crops in a particular point of time. Actually cropping pattern, the concept is a dynamic one. It changes with the time and the space. So the proportion of area under various crops at a point of time. So simply we can say that the farmers, okay, how they allot the land to different crops in a particular point of time. Okay, there is a cropping pattern, right? So after giving this definition, what is cropping pattern? Okay, the introduction is we can define what is cropping pattern. And then we can say there are various factors affecting the cropping pattern, physical factors. Under the physical factors, we include the climatic factors, soil factors, so they come under the physical factors, then socio-economic factors, so the consumption pattern, they come under the socio-economic pattern, socio-economic condition, then technological factors, right, so we can, okay, we can uh, classify into various categories, okay, the factors of eating, cropping pattern. Now, so after giving this uh, flow chart, so we can explain again this question consists of two parts so what are the consumption pattern the consumption uh, styles of okay, indian population so they change the cropping pattern then marketing factors how they change the cropping pattern so regarding the consumption pattern one a historical example in india the cropping pattern Earlier in the Punjab region, the northeastern part of India, so they are mainly okay, they were called uh, wheat hotland. Then in the eastern part of India is called rice hotland. But after the Green Revolution, the cropping pattern has changed okay, from 1965 onwards. So based on the consumption, so the dietary, uh, in case of okay, North India, the staple food is wheat. In South India, the staple food is rice. So you can see the dominance of rice cultivation in the entire South India, especially after the Green Revolution, the rice cultivation dominated in the entire South India, especially the East Coast of India. So earlier, before Green Revolution, the main staple food of the South India actually millets, but the millets were replaced by rice in the entire South India. Then northwestern north -west part of India, Punjab, Haryana, the entire IGP region, rice also introduced into those region. So the entire northwestern part of India, North India, now rice, wheat based cropping pattern is a major one. Right. So nearly more than uh, 40 million hectares okay, area covered under the rice, wheat based cropping pattern. So this is one of the historical uh, the change in the cropping pattern. So recently, in the cropping pattern, there are so many changes okay, based on the, the consumption pattern. For example, um, recently the awareness is very high regarding the consumption of nutritious food. So the farmers are focusing on the, um, especially the recent government program regarding the millets, international year of millets, national year of millets. And the government is implementing various schemes for the promotion of pulses also. So both the pulses and the millets are nutritionally rich products. So gradually, in recent time, the area under the pulses and millets are increasing in the in our agriculture, Indian agriculture. So it shows that so the farmers are moving from the 
the existing rice wheat based cropping system to nutritious foods so this one okay important change then okay especially on a specific example in rajasthan the millets area and the pulses area okay increasing from the existing cereals then again uh, in the especially in the dryland region dryland and the rainfed region so because of the okay, new, new, the health consciousness recently many farmers are uh, cultivating the dragon fruit i think this is one of the exotic fruit but increasing area under the dragon fruit cultivation in the dryland areas then again in the himachal pradesh avocados and the kiwi fruits so their cultivation also increasing in the himachal region okay then especially in the urban areas based on the consumer demand because in the urban areas the areas around the urban centers there will be more demand for the processed foods so the food processing companies the food processing industries mostly the mnc companies are the food processing companies so they promote the farmers they engage directly with the farmers through contract farming so they uh, provide all the necessary inputs to the farmers to cultivate the the processed okay the crops for the processed foods okay for example the pepsico company they entered into contract with the for the punjab farmers for the cultivation of potato for making lays chips then many uh, the government is also promoting uh, the food processing companies through a scheme called a mega food park so under the mega food park scheme the mnc companies they set up the processing uh, the pulping industries so these companies they procure products from the the farmers directly from the farmers uh, the goa goa papaya mango so the farmers are okay, cultivating the crops based on the demand from the the, the food processing companies okay. <clears throat> right then so demand for livestock feed one more factor and india is actually uh, having the largest livestock population in the, in the in the world so to meet the demand for the livestock feed in many dryland regions the farmers are growing sorghum feed and the fodder crops so sorghum feed and the fodder crops for the livestock livestock population then the e-commerce agencies so they procure products from the farmers again based on the demand from the consumers especially the elite consumer urban consumers the cherry tomatoes cherry tomatoes and the exotic the fruits so they directly they promote the e-commerce companies they promote the farmers okay for the cultivation of this kind of exotic fruits and high value crops so these changes in the cropping pattern occurs mainly because of the change in the consumption pattern okay so we can discuss under the four or five headings then market conditions so next important factor determining the marketing marketing conditions so export potential again the farmers they choose the crops based on the export potential so this is one of the important marketing factor for example the cotton cotton cultivation so it's very common okay very famous in the maharashtra and gujarat region apart from that in uh, other regions also in the punjab so even the punjab is said come under the arid and semi arid zone so in punjab also the farmers they grow the cotton and in uh, tamil nadu in the southern parts of india also they grow many farmers they grow the cotton cultivation because of the cotton has a high export value moreover for the 
promotion of cotton the government uh, to increase the crop diversification the government included the cotton crop under the scheme called crop diversification program and the cotton is also included under the national food security mission so the unconventional areas they also grow cotton because of the export potential and the government schemes then government policies and the msp so in many regions the farmers follow the rice wheat based cropping system because they get assured price from the the government agencies procurement agencies so the msp is also one of the main reason for the promotion of right rice wheat based cropping system then our demand for so recently the government is promoting oil seeds and because of that the oil palm cultivation okay in many areas the farmers are cultivating oil palm and the, the government is running a separate scheme for the national mission for oil palm also oil seeds and this mainly due to the the import bill because we are spending huge amount for the importing of edible oil from other countries so the government is actually running a scheme national mission on oil palm so it it promotes actually it promotes it provide incentives to the farmers for the cultivation of oil palm and oil seeds so the oil seed based cropping is increasing in india because of the, these reasons so we can include these points under the marketing factors okay right <clears throat> then we can write a suitable conclusion for this question then question number 14 so what are the direct indirect farm subsidies provided to farm sector in india discuss the issues raised by the world trade organization in relation to agriculture subsidies so there are two types of subsidies in indian agriculture direct indirect subsidies so the first part of the question we have to explain the direct indirect subsidies so the direct subsidies are the direct income supporting measures to the farmers so here on just i told you the famous scheme pm kisan under the pm kisan the government is providing 6000 rupees cash subsidy to the farmers per year then the farmers they purchase inputs at a subsidized price the subsidies available for inputs they come under the direct subsidies so the inputs okay for example for the purchase of seeds for the purchase of fertilizers and for the purchase of other agrochemicals so these products available at a cheaper price to the farmers at a subsidized price to the farmers so they come under the direct subsidies then the crop insurance scheme and the infrastructure development in agriculture r&d research and development in crop cultivation so these factors are come under the indirect subsidies right so you need to explain so what is direct subsidy what is indirect subsidy then after giving this okay, so giving this examples and explanation then we move to the next area the wto so what are the issues raised by the wto in the in case of indian subsidies and before that we can give some value addition in the introduction itself so the subsidies actually the government is spending nearly uh, 2 lakh crore last year they allocated 2 lakh 25 thousand crore for the food subsidy alone and the government is spending nearly 1 lakh 25 thousand crore for the more than 1 lakh crore for the uh, fertilizer subsidy so this is a major burden okay the in case of subsidies the government is facing severe burden in the exchequer in the, in the government exchequer right apart from that the wto is also raising concerns of, regarding our india's the subsidy system especially our msp system minimum support price system so what is the issue with the okay, wto and the, especially the developed countries the developed countries they are questioning our 
subsidy system. So in the WTO, there is an agreement called Agreement on Agriculture. Thambi. Okay. So there is an agreement on agriculture. So under the agreement on agriculture, there are three uh, pillars of agreement on agriculture regarding the export subsidies, regarding domestic support, and uh, one more uh, principle called the WTO, de minimis principle. Under the de minimis principle, the aggregate measure of support, that is AMS, AMS means the total measure of support from in agriculture. So, the aggregate measure of support, it should not be more than 10 percentage of the total value of aggregate production in a country. So, this is called a diminished principle. So, the total aggregate measure of support should not be more than 10 percentage of the total value of the aggregate production in a particular country. But many countries, even the developed countries and the USA and India, actually they are uh, breaching this limit. But so this is the main criticism from the WTO. So many developed countries they criticize India for the breaching the, the de minimis principle because India's the MSP system under the minimum support price system, in, the, in case of food subsidy, India is spending nearly 225,000 crore. So it is breaching actually, the value is breaching the de minimis principle. That is the main criticism by the WTO, the member countries. So what is the issue with our uh, the PDA system, our MSP system in WTO? Actually, WTO classified these subsidies as here, trade distorting subsidies. So why they are called trade distorting subsidies? That is the subsidies given for the inputs, the direct income supporting measures to the farmers, the PM Kisan scheme, are the, the subsidies given for the inputs. Then our MSP system, minimum support price system, so, why the government is okay, actually the WTO is criticizing our subsidy system because they are classified under the trade distorting subsidies. So, how they distort the trades? So, in the international market, if you provide subsidies to the farmers, then it leads to underpricing of our products in the international market. So, when the quality is same in the international market, then usually the consumers they go with the, the product with the lesser price. So, we can create a stiff competition in the international market because of this underpricing. Our demand for our parts will increase in the international market. So, our farmers, they provide a stiff competition to the other international players. So, that leads to dumping of the Indian products in the international market. So, this is the main criticism, the concern raised by the WTO, right? So, that's why they are opposing the, the entire subsidy system, right? So, the based on that, they brought a agreement called agreement on agriculture, but the countries are not concerned. Okay, so far, still the discussion negotiation is going on. So far, no specific conclusions okay, uh, reached in the agreement on agriculture. So many developing countries, including Argentina, India, so they are opposing the agreement on agriculture because it is highly favored towards the developed countries. Then one more issue with our uh, uh, subsidy system, the PDA system. One more criticism uh, by the developed countries. So, in the PDA system, we procure food grains from the farmers at the rate of MSP, minimum support price. Actually, we have excess stock in our uh, food grains, so in the buffer stock, we have excess stock. So, after meeting our food security demand, we export these food grains to the other countries, especially the European countries and the African countries at a cheaper price. This is the main criticism by the developed countries. Again, we provide a stiff competition to the uh, the European countries okay, in terms of okay, the wheat. So suppose okay, if you import, if you export wheat to uh, African countries, then the European countries also they produce wheat. So when compared to the European wheat, our Indian wheat are cheap in the African markets. So this is again okay, so the problem in the international market. Right. So the main uh, criticism is there. so we pro we uh, with, okay, with the help of okay, the MSP system. Um, we procure at a cheaper price from the, the farmers at the rate of MSP. Then, instead of distributing the products in the food security system, after meeting our own demand, the excess food grains, actually the food grains are rotting our good owns. 
so in this case instead of rotting our good ones our main criticism is we are exporting this fragrance to the european country the third world countries at a very cheaper price okay right <clears throat> but actually this is only allegation so uh, there is no proper fact or uh, it's not true it's not entirely true it's only allegation so this allegation prop okay uh, allegation by the developed countries right so in this case actually india stand in this case Uh, we cannot abolish the the entire subsidy system because we are running this system okay the subsidy system for our meeting the india's food security demand for the growing india's food security demand actually we are feeding currently we are feeding the 80 crore population and we are running the world's largest food security program okay All right so in this way we can justify we can justify the india's stand so there are two issues in the wto one is uh, the developed countries they are opposing the the subsidies given for the inputs and another issue they are opposing our the pda system right so we can support india stand in the wto issues okay so actually we are opposing the agreement on agriculture right so in this question we can uh, so the wto okay the developed countries and developing countries they should okay they should form a, a proper agreement that should uh, maintain a the proper uh, balance between the developed countries and the developing countries okay you should okay, promote the interest of both developed as well as developing countries okay right <clears throat> 2023 upsc mains question paper paper 3 in this paper 3 we are going to discuss the disaster management question this year in upsc from the disaster management syllabus they have asked one question usually if you see the previous years questions of disaster management portion 2013 two questions 2014 one question 151 one 16 1 17 1 18 1 19 2 21 21 2 22 1 one and this year 2023 we have one question so usually there would be a one question from the topic of the disaster management area as usually the upsc have also asked the uh, one question from that portions of the disaster management usually in the disaster management topic the question would be either in the disaster or in the portion of management management this year the upsc have asked from the portion of disaster area that is dam burst previous years the upsc have asked questions from the disaster area like earthquake landslide urban flood commonly as flood these types of area they have touched so this year is with the dam burst okay this is the question the question is the seventh question in the 10 marks area with 150 words so we see the question dam failures are always catastrophic especially on the downstream side resulting in a colossal loss of life and property analyze the various causes of dam failures give two examples of the large dam failures 10 marks in 150 words so the area of question is regarding the dam failures this is the area of question what is the demand of the question the demand of the question is causes various causes this is the first demand of the question the second demand of the question is examples that is two examples we have to give it for them so two examples we have to give it and the third demand is we have to analyze this question third analysis 
let me see how this question is to be presented. First introduction of the question. So the question is regarding the dam failure. So our answer should be regarding for the dam failure. So dam failure. In how the question is being presented, it is presented in the form of catastrophic, especially in the downstream side, resulted in the form of loss of life and property. So, our introduction should be a collective formation of all these three things: dam failure, and because of the dam, because of the dam failure. <coughs> How it formed the catastrophic form the catastrophic loss of life and property life and property that should be our introduction. So the introduction part should be the ensembling of the content what we are going to write it that is what okay what is the next demand of the question the next demand is regarding the various causes that is what they are asking various causes of the dam failure so various causes regarding dam failure So the first and the foremost cause of the dam failure was the natural disaster. In the natural disaster we have to discuss about the, the first one flood. Flood along with the heavy rain. Due to heavy rain, there would be a <coughs> flood in many parts of the area. Because of the flood, the dam would unable to hold its capacity if they failed to leave, if they, if they leave, if they lay, if they failed to uh, open the water from the barrage. So, because of that, that would be resulted in the form of the dam burst. So, which would be a catastrophic for them. So, the first two would be for it be the uh, flood and the heavy rain. The second one is earthquake. If the dam falls unfortunately in the earthquake prone region, in case if the earthquake has happened, it may affect the dam because of the earthquake. The dam may have a burst and because of that, that would be catastrophic for the life and the loss of property also. So, that would be the second one, natural disaster. And the second would be design and construction. The design and construction of the dam itself is considered to be as a wrong one or would be a faulty one in, in, in some cases. And because of the faulty design and construction and the dam in a period of time, it may resulted in the form of a dam burst and which would be <coughs> resulted in the form of catastrophic for the life and the property. And the third one, that would be in the form of the <coughs> aging infrastructure. Many dams in India are constructed long time back. We have dams, <coughs> Tehri Dam, we have a bank of Krishna Sahar 
and we have a dam of Stanley Reservoir and we have a dam of the <coughs> Narmada and many dams are constructed for a very long time ago and because of these things the dams are aging. Because of the aging factor of the dam, the infrastructure what we have used for those dams are also become aging because of that. It lost its life period because of these things. Because of the aging factor of the dam, the dam may be in a poor condition and because of the poor condition of the dam, the dam may be busted and that was resulted in the form of a catastrophic in life and loss of property. Poor maintenance. The dam may be maintained in a very poor maintenance condition. The dam may be not con uh, uh, maintained very properly. So, a dam should be very properly maintained. It should be very uh, frequently visited and it should be properly checked or any cracks in the dam. There are many dams which have, uh, which have cracked in the, uh, over a long period of time because of the poor maintenance and there would be a seepage of water from those uh, cracks. And in, uh, uh, if we unnoticed those things for a very long duration of time and there would be a bust happened in that uh, seepages and the crack and that would be resulted in the form of a dam burst and which would be resulted in the form of a catastrophic for the life and property. And the foundation problems, next one would be the foundation problem. Some of the dams would be constructed in a very, uh, 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 very low, uh, very bad soil condition, geological condition. The geological condition may not be feasible and the geological condition may not be satisfactory. But unfortunately, because of some other thing, they have, they have constructed a dam in those area or in some cases where the geological factor may be changed in a subsequent period of time, over a period of time. What marshy land or water would be penetrated into that area or the soil would become very weak and the, const and the constructive area where the dam was built became a very weak geological condition in a later period of time. So, that factor is also resulted in the form of the uh, dam burst <coughs> which would be resulted in the form of the catastrophic for the life and the property of the people. And the next one, overtopping. Many dams would be capacity having for more, having more uh, huge water level and uh, with, uh, with the perm above the permissible level the dam would have the water level because of that the dam would be hold beyond its capacity. When the dam is having a water beyond its capacity there would be a water pressure inside the dam. The water pressure should be hold by the dam. If the dam is failed to hold its water capacity, then the dam would be busted, would be busted. So, the overtoppling and over inflow or also we can add the excessive inflow of water. In this, we can add it as a excess inflow of water. Because of the excessive inflow of water of the overtoppling, what would happen means the, the dam failed to hold the water uh, capacity and the gravity of the water and there would be a pressure from all sides to the dam. When the dam unable to hold its capacity, that would be busted out. So, that would be resulted in the form of the catastrophic to the life and property. Spilling design error. In some dam, usually in a dam, the water inflow would happen. When the water was continuously inflow into the dam, 
the excessive water should be sent out of the dam or would be opened opened out for many of the irrigational for other purpose areas or agricultural purpose areas in some dams the water would be spilling design would be errored the water would not be spilled out of the dam in a very proper way in if the dam have no proper way of spilling out of its water what would happen means same thing what would happen in the excessive inflow of water that would be happen if the water is not spilled out of the dam <clears throat> very frequently or in a proper way that would be happen in the form of a pressure inside the dam that pressure would create the bust of the dam which would be resulted in the form of the catastrophe for the life on the property so so that would be the causes mostly these would be the causes for the uh, dam burst or dam failure that would be the thing and another demand of the question is two examples we have to write it the two examples are one the machachu dam failure where in the machachu dam failure that was in 1979 where the dam was busted out and many lives are lost because of those things and the second one is the rishi ganga dam that was in uttarakhand in 2021 where the dam was busted out and because of the busting out of the dam we have we have seen the catastrophic of life loss of life and property because of that one and what would be the conclusion for this one the conclusion so in the conclusion we should because it is a dam failure we have to give a solution type of this one or way forward of the way forward of thing in this uh, in this question that is either conclusion or the way forward so that should be the proper maintenance of the dam proper maintenance frequent monitoring and checking of dam frequent monitoring and checking of the dam we have to prepare the community also that is community preparedness because when the dam is busted out or in the dam is in the bad condition or it is in the very dangerous condition we have to evacuate the people and we have to bring an awareness to the people so that sh that awareness should be among the people so this this awareness should be brought to the people in the nearby area so we have to prepare the civil society and also the community of people which are who are present in the in and around the region of the dam or the peripheral regions of the dam and another thing is we have to in, uh, already we have the day, dam safety act of 2021 so we have to follow the rules and regulations that present in the uh, dam safety dam, dam safety safety act of 2021 and the dam safety rehabilitation and improvement project that is the that is the drip
DRIP, Dam Safety Rehabilitation and Improvement Project uh, that should be taken and it should be followed in the right direction. All these things should be done in the right direction. That's all.